Melinda Davenport here back again with my co-host and creative powerhouse Karen X Chang and we are nearing the end of the day I can't believe it time flies of course when you're having fun so has MetaConnect sparked any ideas in you confirmed anything basically we all want to know what cool projects you're working on next uh, so many ideas, uh, especially with augmented reality. You know, this year I've mostly experimented with AR by creating effects on Instagram. But if you've never made an AR effect before, I really recommend it. It's honestly the most empowering experience when thousands of people can use something that you've made, but then they can put their own creative spin on it. And that's just been with AR effects on a phone. So imagine what it's going to be like when AR developers can start creating virtual objects with a full-on mixed reality headset. You know, I have to say, I really appreciate how thoughtful all of today's speakers have been. They were very open about both the challenges and the opportunities on the road ahead for the developer community. And personally, I think there's just gonna be an explosion of creativity and possibility and just new ideas we can't even imagine right now. Well, I'm excited that you're excited. <laughs> and that's actually kind of the perfect insight as we prepare our final moment of the day with none other than John Carmack. What do you think about that? I wanna hear his take. Totally, same, same, unscripted no less. Hold on to your headsets. As this community is well aware, John Carmack is a consulting CTO for Reality Labs at Meta, as well as an AI researcher, aerospace engineer, and the founder and lead programmer at id Software for the Commander Keen, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake Games. Lots going on. Okay, busy guy. He's such an innovator in the industry. Can't wait to hear from him. No joke. It's serious business over here. And you're not going to want to miss his insights on the future of technology. It feels like the perfect culmination of today's journey, right? So without further ado, please join us in welcoming the one, the only, John Carmack. And he's coming to us in avatar form. Hey everyone. So last year I said that I'd be disappointed if we weren't having Connect in Horizon this year. And I was kind of planning to lead off pretty grumpy here because we really don't have the physical Connect experience replicated here. But I watched the keynote in Horizon with a room full of people and it was really pretty good. The video quality on the giant screen was nice. Uh, the little side effects going on added a nice subtle touch and just being in a room with a couple dozen other people that care about the same thing uh, is a positive thing. So I was kind of like peeking out from underneath my headset, looking at my cluttered desk with my meta laptop and a window open there and thinking that, yeah, this really does have some genuine benefits over looking at it in the way most people view most presentations. So I'm... Um, but when Mark came out live as an avatar, I was genuinely surprised. I didn't attend any of the rehearsals, so I didn't really know what was going to be happening there. And while, you know, that was a pre-recorded CAN system, uh, that's what I want to be doing live. You know, that kind of walking around on stage and everybody in the room came down up to the railing to be closer to the avatars. And that seemed to have some, you know, some real positive things. That's what I wanted to do. You know, this here, this isn't really what I meant. I mean, me being an avatar on screen on a video for you is basically the same thing as just being on a video. You know, instead of a makeup artist putting anti shine on my face ahead of time, I had my girlfriend tweaking my avatar before Connect, but it's the same basic process as a video presentation. You know, I, I want to be present with a live audience and in a virtual space where everyone that wanted to could stay afterwards and talk as long as they felt like it. You know, I was in Horizon before the keynote, and someone was asking if they'd be able to talk with the presenters after the shows, and I had to say no. But I think we can see kind of a path forward now, and I'm pretty excited about that. Now, doing an event in Horizon for real, like in an ideal world, would mean having the sort of arena scale support with thousands of avatars milling around, at least hundreds in large rooms, and, you know, in a completely uniformly shared world. Now, that's a serious technical challenge, and Horizon definitely can't handle it now, but it's not an insurmountable one. However, there's a really huge tension with avatar rendering quality. You know, there was some public mockery about avatar quality earlier this year, and now lots of people internally are paranoid about showing anything but the highest possible quality avatars. 
and more rendering features are being pushed to increase the quality instead of the quantity. I mean, I'm actually doing this in a custom build of Horizon, built only so that it could absolutely lock the level of detail on my avatar to never drop down no matter what's going on. And if you're in Horizon now, if you look around at the other people, there's a very good chance you're seeing some LED changes and poppings and things going on right now. Now, just imagine if we double the intensity of the rendering quality on the individual avatars. Maybe the guy right next to you will have good quality, but that's going to come at the expense of everything else after it. So I, you know, I really worry about that. And then the big push towards photorealism and Kodak avatars. I, you know, we've got we've got a finite amount of resources on our headsets here, and cloud rendering won't save us in many cases. Uh, so I think that the, you know, I like our avatars today. I'm pretty happy with these. It's been great seeing all the extra options continue to increase. And I'm happy whenever I see a new app that renders the avatars, uh, you know, as they are. And especially the, the non-VR family of meta apps gives them multiple orders of magnitude more reach. So I think these are all, you know, really pretty positive things. So I definitely lean towards optimizing for quantity rather than quality. I am, you know, we've had apps where you're limited to four people or eight people, and it's just not as good for a lot of the applications as when you can have at least a couple dozen, but ideally a lot more. So, but even within the, the avatar rendering limits of Horizon today, events like this can still be pretty cool. I mean, my avatar here could be replicated to an arbitrary number of other shards, uh, even if it's only 20 people each, and people could maybe flag themselves for being in a waiting line to transfer to the prime shard when spaces open up. So if we can't solve the hard scalability problem, we should sort of embrace sharding as kind of the horizon multiverse and give users tools for easily migrating between instances to group up with their friends or the company reps that they want to meet. Uh, you know, universal waiting lines to get into anything that they want to. So uh, we already have a lot of good support here for professional camera and production work already. I mean, I'm sitting in this room with production people and a half dozen cameras moving around, and there's a whole crew kind of dealing with all that, just like they would on a real professional event. So I think that this can be a genuinely valuable thing for a lot of conferences, and conventions are they're expensive. It's big business. Uh, for the costs that go into lots of these things, you could just give attendees a free headset in many cases and still come out ahead. So um, Horizon Worlds isn't really my realm. You know, I, I'm just lobbing a few grenades over the wall with my comments here. I personally wind up caring a lot more about the main VR home environment. You know, internally, we call that VR shell. Uh, it's rebranded as Horizon Home now, but uh, every single Quest user interacts with it. And I did write the original core of it many years ago, so I kind of have some personal fondness for it. But there's a bunch that I'm grumpy about. Uh, performance is degraded a lot over the years. Uh, we're rarely locked at the 90 frames per second target that we aim at. It bothers me every single time I use VR. I've even given the suggestion that I give to game developers that if you can't hold 90, you should drop back to 72 because smoother at a lower frame rate is better than kind of being uneven and jittery. But it isn't clear how many glitches you know that would cover. You know, our app startup times are slow. Our transitions are glitchy. But I can see light at the end of the tunnel for the pitch that I've been making for years. You know, there's one click to social presence and a general purpose screen sharing model. So we launched co-presence in home recently, and there's all sorts of glitchy stuff around it. But when you actually get into it, and you've got the interaction with the avatars. I think it's great. You know, it's basically what you get in Horizon Worlds here, but in your home. And it, it at least has the potential for being much, much faster and probably somewhat higher avatar counts because we are in a completely native environment rather than a Unity environment. But we need to make it a whole lot better. You know, we need to make it much, much faster to get into. The thing that I love is that if you've got your friend on the Explore main page, I, you point at them, you hover over them, the party dialog pops up, you can just click on that, invites them to the party. It really is that one click to social presence that I've wanted for years and years. Now it winds up taking a minute for them to, to get into your space and environment. Uh, and we could get that down to hopefully a small number of seconds where you click on that and the response is as fast as somebody responding to a text message or something. You know, that's the, the North Star that I wanna see there is that jumping into VR synchronous social environments is as fast as the things that you do on your phone, the finely tuned mobile apps that really matter. Uh, some of the other little things that are going into that, 
is we probably are, we are going to be moving home so that you're embodied by default, where right now you're just the disembodied controllers floating there. And the first time you wind up joining a social environment there, for some people, that's the first time they've ever seen their avatar. Some people just kind of skip past that. And we'll get to the point where we do draw your body and, uh, and arms like we do in Horizon Worlds in the home space, which will push people to get their avatar set up early and quickly. Uh, we're also going to put a really nice mirror into the world so that you can go ahead and set yourself up again, show you the avatar, make sure you're comfortable with it very early on. And a little in the weeds technical bit, uh, almost all the mirrors that you see in VR games are done by rendering a separate view. And they're, they're usually blurrier, alias, generally not particularly high quality. While in home, we're doing a neat little trick, which is actually what I was doing all the way back in the Doom 3 game, where you sort of flip the world around, render through that cutout, and you can get as high a quality in the mirror as you get looking at things directly, which is kind of a nice little touch. Uh, something else in the home environment, you can move around now. A lot of people haven't even gotten this, really, because it's a little bit unintuitive. You have to put away the menu system, then you can do a teleport move around. And I keep pushing for we really should have general purpose navigation. I wind up arguing with designers all the time where they really want to make sure the user can never get into a place where they sort of break the the modeling of the world, poking their head through things. So you wind up with just specific pre-generated points. And that winds up not being good if you get a large group and you're not structured exactly the way you want. You really want to be able to nudge around. But, you know, I think that, that that'll get sorted out pretty soon. Uh, the other side of this, though, is once you're there, yeah, lots of people spend lots of time in VR chat rooms with nothing but other people and mirrors. And there's, you know, there's value to be had there. But I think there's this enormous block of value to be unlocked with screen sharing. And we have the basics of co-watching working in a specialized form with what's going on in sharing the immersive videos that you can see. And there's efforts going on to work on some specific progressive web apps for shared environments. But I keep pushing for a completely universal thing. Anything that you're doing on a panel, we should just re-encode it, share it with everybody, even if it does mean a quality loss over an otherwise optimal approach of kind of streaming from a central source. Because there are so many things that people do. I mean, people do basically everything on screens now. And if we can bring awesome synchronous social in here that's fast and easy and everyone can be easily sharing what they're working on, I think it's going to be a pretty significant value. We're doing a lot of this in Horizon Worlds and Horizon Workrooms, but these are very heavyweight apps. It's a big deal to start it up, to get into the world, to get things going. And in so many things that I care about, it's this worrying about the latency for actions, whether it's milliseconds in tracking or seconds in starting up an app experience. It matters to be fast. And I keep pushing on this Make it, you know, make it super fast, make it super easy, not a lot of steps, even if it's not everything for everyone, but making it a powerful, awesome feature that does work super easily for uh, and quickly for everyone. So we've got, uh, we made a bunch of advances in the voice latency where that was really bad uh, where we were at last year. And in many cases, it's been cut in half. And we have some people now that are passionate about cutting it down even more where I want us to get to the point where our voice communication is solidly better than anything that you get on a cell phone, where, you know, we can be, if once we get all the way down to tweaking the firmware for the audio drivers and things, we can get to, you know, half or a quarter of what a lot of the voice communication that people work with right now, which can be really valuable. Uh, th there's tension between what we wind up doing in home versus worlds, where I think there's another valuable point there. If we make it this great thing for people to just be jumping in super quickly to each other's worlds, then it's only one teeny tiny step to having those be persistent little worlds where it doesn't have to be tied to one person. Uh, I keep saying that every Facebook group should have a room associated with it. Um, but I desperately don't want to reinvent Horizon Worlds inside Horizon Home. You know, if you want a dynamic, interactive thing, go to Horizon Worlds. I am, you know, I just want Home to be focused on avatars and panels in a good-looking static world. I, we have people that want to be implementing 
scene graph animations, all programming language support, all sorts of crazy stuff in home. And I'm just like, no, push that off. Go do that in Horizon Worlds. Let's just keep this as simple and clean as possible so that they have minimally overlapping spheres of influence for things. You know, as a side note, it was really nice that Horizon Worlds has finally announced moving to support traditional triangle meshes. So you, know, you can get higher quality environments. Like uh, a lot of people comment how Horizon Worlds, they just don't look as good as the home environments. And that's because the home environments are raw geometry, pre-lit textures put on them. They're built uh, in, by modelers in modeling tools that are highly optimized for this instead of the Horizon Worlds space, which was optimized around user-generated content and a lot of dynamic ability. So there's always trade-offs there. But there's clearly a lot of power in polygon meshes, and I think that it's going to be good for them that they'll they'll be able to pull in a lot more of that quality stuff. So uh, everybody surely wants to hear about Quest Pro, and I've always been clear that I'm all about the cost-effective mass market headsets being the most important thing for us and for the adoption of VR, and Quest Pro is definitely not that. It's a high-priced system, but it is a very fine piece of engineering that explores a number of new spots in the kind of VR design space. Now, I think they're calling it an XR2 Plus chipset, but it's basically the same cores as what you get on a Quest 2, but it's built so that we can access a lot more memory and it has a much better thermal dissipation. So you can wind up running it uh, at higher clocks uh, and get more out of it. I've been saying it for years where... We can't run any of our systems anywhere near what their theoretical maximums are because they'll just overheat. You know, the heat dissipation is a really big deal. And there's some specific details around the chip packaging that means you can't just necessarily slap a bigger heat sink on this. Sometimes you need to change the way the entire chip is packaged. Um, we are working closely with Qualcomm on a, a really next generation XR2 chip. Um, you know, I've been really supportive of our Qualcomm partnership. There's lots of people internally that really want to make our own chips. And, you know, at some point you want to, you know, Apple takes control of their own destiny, making their chips internally. But, you know, I don't think we're at that point and I don't think it would work out that well. And Qualcomm has been a great partner to work with. And there are several very custom VR specific features going in that I'm excited about in the future uh, beyond just the normal CPU and GPU advances that you're pretty much expecting. You know, I do kind of worry, though, that it's a very high-end chip, and we may need something low-end targeted for inexpensive VR headsets in the future, though. So one of the things that drove the Quest Pro design from really early on was this notion of form factor. Uh, there were a bunch of people internally that thought that the uh, the kind of shoebox on your face point of uh, the existing VR headsets was a major uh, barrier to adoption. And uh, making it smaller, more compact, a little more stylish was a really high high point, and, and it drove a lot of the point uh, the push to pancake lenses. And I'm not sure how important that is, but I am the wrong person to I uh, you know to add to talk about what's going to be important from kind of a fashion or social sense there. Uh, it's got a larger battery. If you use it just like a Quest Two without engaging any of the new features, you know it should last longer. And importantly, it's mounted in the back of the headset. So uh, lots of people wind up using external battery packs for Quest 2 just to kind of balance out the weight and make it more comfortable. But in Quest 2, you can't literally remove the battery from the front of the headset and put it in back. Uh, you know, this headset's kind of built like that. And then we've got the charging dock with it, which is probably more important than a lot of people think where it is a, it is a huge issue for us where people not having their headsets plugged in and not being updated and all the things that fall off from that, where we've got the, with the head, with the charging stand, it's obvious what you're supposed to do. You put it back on the charging stand and it will always be ready. And that's probably going to lead to some significantly better kind of user satisfaction metrics versus the, the Quest 2, which you may power off, you may plug back in, you may charge up and take off, all sorts of different possibilities there. So the overall headset is heavier, but the comfort's broadly better than a baseline Quest 2, especially for the less dynamic applications. You know, if you are just sitting there doing work applications or watching a movie or something, having it sit resting on your head without any pressure on your face is unquestionably a better situation. Um, you know, you can, we have people that leave it plugged in and have been using it for many, many hours a day, 
noting how much more comfortable it is than uh, than Quest 2. So you have eye relief adjustment where you can have it adjust the screen, you know, closer or further away, but you don't have tilt adjustment like you could on the, the kind of ear sides on Quest 2. So some pros and cons there. Uh, you've got smooth IPD adjustment. So people that weren't close to one of the Quest 2's uh, three notchy adjustments are liable to get uh, a better experience. But it also, because of the optics, it has a, a broader, dyna kind of a broader eye box no matter where you've got it. Probably the most important thing that people will appreciate is the crisper display. And that's both do due to somewhat higher resolution, but also very much the pancake lenses. With Quest 2, when you looked kind of straight ahead through, you know, the middle 20, 30 degrees, you would usually have a really good picture. If your eye eyes were lined up, the IPD was correct, you could, uh, people with good eyesight could still kind of basically see the pixels there. But once you got out of that range towards the outside, uh, even just being off center, and then especially when the Fresnel rings started going out, that was hurting the view a lot. So I was I was saying before that Quest 2 is really optics limited more than pixel limited over the vast majority of the screen. Uh, with Quest Pro, it really is clear pretty much out to the edges where you can bring up a dense web page with small text, spread it out over most of your field of view, and you can read by just tracking your eyes back and forth. While, you know, with Quest 2, you would really kind of have to look over and track your head around back and forth. But uh, the downsides of this is that the blurriness around the edges in Quest 2 is what let us uh, do the fixed foveated rendering, where we kind of chop down the rendering quality around the outsides if an app asked for it. And that could get us you know, 20 percent performance in some cases. If you do the exact same thing on a Quest Pro, it's much more obvious that the pixels are getting chunkier and blurrier over to the edges. So that's something that I, um, you know, is a little bit of a balance because, again, we really don't have more GPU power. And if you ask it to render a lot more GPU pixels, I am, you know, you run the risk of running into frame rate problems there. So uh, the pancake lenses do have a little bit of intensity vignetting where it's a little bit darker around the outsides. Uh, we can choose to correct for that, but it then means losing some of our dynamic range in the middle. It's not, it's not really clear what the right choice there is. Uh, one thing I'm very happy with, though, is that a lot of pancake lens designs do have sort of a characteristic ghosting of where you can sort of see multiple copies of of an image if you've got really high contrast. And our production lenses here, I have yet to see uh, an occurrence of that that really bothers me. So that's uh, that's a really nice thing. Um, we do have a segmented backlight on here, which has two values, where instead of in Quest 2, there was the, a single screen, but we did have two backlights on it where we could flash the left backlight and the right backlight independently. And we, at 120 frames per second, we skew them a little bit to give us a little bit more margin for the LCDs to settle. Uh, Quest Pro has a whole lot of backlights, a full grid of them. So we can kind of strobe them off in rows or columns uh, as we scan things out, which lets us sort of get the ability of chasing a rolling shutter like we have on some other things, which should give us some extra latency. But unfortunately, some other choices in this display architecture cost us some latency. So we didn't wind up you know, really getting a win with that. But one of the exciting possible things that you can do with this is do local dimming, where if you know that an area of the screen has nothing but black in it, you could literally turn off the bits of the backlight there. So that gets you back to the sort of awesome OLED blacks that you could get on some of the earlier displays. And those earlier displays, a lot of people, you know, speak very fondly of them but their low bit precision was really pretty terrible. It's like, yes, black was off, but you go up to one and two and there are these large, ugly steps or you've got uh, you know, mirror correction issues going on. So it was not a pure win. Uh, so you can get great pure blacks on this display. Now it's not enabled by default because to do this, we have to kind of scan over the screens and that costs us some time and we don't have a lot of extra time here, but a layer can choose to enable uh, this extra local dimming. And if you've got black areas, then they will go to completely black, but it costs a little bit. And if you've got like an environment like I'm in right now, there's literally no complete, maybe a little bit on one of those surfaces over there. That's a, a complete black. On most systems, uh, most scenes, it doesn't wind up actually benefiting you. But the uh, 
The exciting thing that we don't really have yet is the ability to do uh, extra high dynamic range, where in an ideal world, you could look at every pixel on the screen, uh, see what range of colors and intensities that it's got, and then choose an optimal backlight value and then rescale everything to the whole 0 to 255 values. Uh, that would be fairly expensive to do in a general purpose sense here. Uh, I'd like to see us do some special demos with uh, like pre-calculated high dynamic range environment maps or something just to kind of show, explore what we could possibly get from it. Um, there's still limits where you're not going to get on an OLED, you can do super bright stars on a dark on a completely black sky. With local dimming, you can't do that because if you've got a max value star in a min value black sky, it's still got to pick something and stretch the pixels around it. But what you can do extremely well is something like being indoors and looking outside where you can have a high quality range of relatively dim colors on the inside and then an almost blindingly bright outdoor light where we have the backlights cranked all the way up. But that's, you know, future speculation work. There's nothing like that right now, but we do have this one flag that we can set up for um, for layer optimization. Um, so the eye, track foveated, uh, eye tracking has a couple purposes. Everybody loves the idea of foveated rendering. Uh, we kind of set ourselves up for this where several years back, Michael Abrash would show these pictures of kind of ray traced images and show that you could take out 99% of all of the pixels. And then if you reconstruct it right, uh, knowing exactly where the fovea is looking, your brain won't really be able to tell the difference. And people have been hoping that this foveated rendering could give us sort of integer multiples of GPU performance. And it's definitely not going to work out like that. And the problems come from uh, aspects of the architecture, both of the eye tracking and also the way we generate our pictures, where the eye tracking is basically little cameras that are looking at your eyes. So to be able to tell where the eye is looking, it has to take a picture, scan that whole image into the main processor. Then it has to run a whole bunch of machine learning models to figure out, all right, where is this actually looking at? There's a lot of uncertainty in how the headset's positioned, uh, how different people's eyes look, you know, their eyelashes interacting with all of that. But you eventually figure out, all right, it's looking at this point here. But what the rendering system needs to know is where is the eye going to be when this image is actually shown on screen? And that's the whole latency of the rendering pipeline. And for most of our systems now, you know, it's in the neighborhood of 50 milliseconds. Now, the eye can move a pretty long ways in 50 milliseconds. And even when it's going relatively smoothly, unlike our controllers that we have, we don't have accelerometers on, uh, like on your eyeball. And extrapolating from just these images is hard. It's hard to do accurately. And if you don't do it accurately and you predict the wrong place, then you wind up looking at a blurry system, you know, a blurry set of pixels. So there's things that we can do to be chopping this down. Um, like right now, you kind of have to specify where the foveated region is ahead of time. But the GPU breaks everything up into these little blocks as it renders them going across the screen. And what we'd ideally like to have is just before the GPU starts rendering a block, it goes and checks will this block be under the eye's fovea when this image is actually displayed? If so, render it at full quality. Otherwise, render it at a reduced quality. We don't have the ability to do that right now, but uh, the system is capable of it. You know, we should be able to work with Qualcomm to, you know, to eventually get something like that in. Uh, but even when all said and done, it's probably not going to be a really big speed up. Uh, in theory, it should be somewhat bigger than what we get with the fixed foveated rendering, but it's only going to be a huge win if you've got very shader heavy systems that are able to like save a whole lot from the pixels. So, you know, don't get too excited about that. Uh, as far as eye tracking from a social standpoint, a lot of people kind of take the eye and face tracking combination of this ability to, uh, to have this extra level of social interaction, all the subtle cues. Again, I'm not the right person to be passing judgment on something for social interaction, but it's uh, lots of engineers are working hard for day zero patch to try to get this as good as possible. But it has, uh, like, I'm not using this right now. I am in a Quest Pro headset, but I don't have any of the special features there enabled. Right now, 
there's at least a decent chance I would wind up doing something very embarrassing looking, uh, which would certainly get captured and pointed out on uh, on camera. But just like with hands, you know, we shipped Quest with no hand tracking whatsoever, but we've had multiple generations of improvement with the same raw data comes in and the models get better and better and the user interactions of these get better and better. So I do expect the social stuff will get, uh, you know, get improved to the point where it really is pretty good. Um, we've got, again, one of the big advances of the, the new chip is that we have lots more memory. And that primarily allows us to do multitasking and it makes app development easier. Uh, you know, most console developers wind up, you start your development on a system that has a bunch more memory and eventually you kind of grind it down so it fits in sort of inside the consumer space. So it's probably going to be pretty helpful for uh, people targeting Quest 2 in the mass market to use the Quest Pro just so they can get their early ideas up and then worry about kind of crunching it down uh, later, you know, saving some of that work. You can get yourself into a bad fix, though, as with any of these cases. If you develop on a system that's not your target one, you can sometimes make tragically bad decisions if you aren't constantly uh, aware of how it's going to be on your low-end system. And the low-end system is still going to be where all your real customers are. Um, so this ability, like with this extra memory, we have this is not enabled on Quest 2, but in Quest Pro, you'd be able to actually pull up browser inside any other experience. You know, you can be in in any game. You could be in Resident Evil, like one of the heavy, really heavyweight games, and still pop up our uh, our system UX and then bring up the browser, look up your cheats or whatever walkthroughs you want to have there. Uh, and then go back and forth quickly to the uh, the main experience. Now, I think that's going to be still possible on Quest 2 as well. Lots of apps don't max out the memory. You might not be able to do it in Resident Evil, but you could do it in Beat Saber. And I still keep pushing for this notion that we need to, at the system level, virtualize enough of our resources so that uh, we are able to do that for, for all the things that people want. Um, the color and high-res pass-through is... I, Probably it's kind of, I'm not the big MR advocate. I, you know, I've yet to see the real big win from these applications. I, I'm not sure it's super mass market, but it felt, it feels really natural when you just put the Quest Pro on and looking through it, you're seeing a high res color view instead of the, the super grainy low res uh, black and white view that we get in Quest 2. And the the presentation, it's still a sparse reconstruction. So uh, flat planar surfaces wind up looking really good, uh, but if you wiggle your fingers around in front of it or you've got lots of edges, you can see artifacts around it. But in a lot of cases, it just does feel really pretty natural. Uh, that couples with the the fact that the Quest has this open kind of side periphery and bottom, which I thought I was going to really, really hate. I am, you know, I'm all about the immersion in these experiences. For years, I've complained just about like our nose light leaks in the headset and the idea of like opening everything up for, for gaming. I, I get it for like other use cases, but I thought it would be really bad. And I'm kind of surprised that I don't mind it as much as I thought I would. The little magnetic clip-in blockers block off the side, but you can still see all the area underneath it. And for a lot of productivity stuff, that makes great sense. There was uh, several years ago, I took an Oculus Go and jigsawed out a big chunk of the bottom there so that I could look down and look at my keyboard when I was doing some remote desktop work. And like right now, I, I have, I'm in a Quest Pro and I'm looking down, I can look down at my notes that I wrote for what I'm going to be talking about here. And this generally works out well. Uh, so this is complementary to a lot of things like tracked keyboards where we can bring into VR this tracked version of something, but you can sort of get free field of view when you actually care about the real world. And so that works out, you know, pretty well. And when you're looking through the pass through like that, it really does make me feel good about the quality of the, the projection and reconstruction and just the fact that you can take your, your controllers, uh, and slide it in and out between the real world underneath it and the virtual world above it, and they line up really well. And when you're in pass-through, the fact that you can look at edges and move around, and it's almost like you've just got kind of a blurry filter wearing on glasses as you look through it. And there's so much detail work that goes into that, and you know, we've had regressions with that over the years, but the team's done a really good job with that. Um, the more flexible controller tracking. So 
each controller really is a full-fledged computer system. Uh, it's got multiple cameras on it. It's doing its own tracking. And that's, uh, it's kind of amazing that that much uh, goes into it. It's not clear that it's necessarily worth it, but you can like put your hands like behind, you can hold it here for a long time where with normal quest tracking, my arms would start freaking out after a few seconds because it can't see any of the uh, any of the LEDs. But now, you know, I can have my hands under the desk here, uh, you know, behind my back, and it's expected to just work. Um, so that's, you know, that's generally nice. There are some downsides, like, you know, I can't wrap my head around and play claw grip for Beat Saber the way I'm used to, because I mean, you'd actually block over the controllers, but but they feel good. Um, now, most well-designed games don't ask you to do a lot of the, the stuff that doesn't work well, so it doesn't necessarily improve too many features, and wise developers won't start doing that just because Quest Pro has these controllers, because Quest 2 still won't. But um, another thing that I do hope is the fact that you've already got we basically are doing three-player shared space with the controllers and the headset now. So I'm hoping that this nudges ahead the demo work that we did years ago of allowing multiple headsets to cohabit in the exact same space, which everybody thought was amazing, but it was hard to just figure out how to productize and what the kind of near-term user value would be for things like that. Um, so... Now, as a counterpoint to all of this Quest Pro design space, I, I do personally still try to drum up interest internally for this vision of a super cheap, super lightweight headset. You know, I've got this rallying cry of $250 and 250 grams as a target, but I, you know, we're not building that headset today, but I keep trying. You know, I think that maybe cutting out a whole bunch of stuff winds up opening up some of the comforts of being super light, um, you know, as well as opening it up to more people at the kind of low-end price points. Now, of course, price points leads to the, the point about the Quest 2 price increase, which is obviously super unpopular, and there's no question that it's weird to have a headset or have a consumer device go up in price later, but they're actually... So the, the dynamics of subsidizing hardware, which is super common on all the consoles, and it's just kind of the way a lot of these closed ecosystems tend to work. I am, you know, the model is you sell, the, you sell the device at a loss and you make it up on kind of the software that you wind up selling. But that winds up having a bunch of perverse incentives for general user value. When you have some of the most popular apps on Quest are free apps, you know, VR chat and Rec Room that, you know, we get no revenue from at all. And while the, uh, you know, they are sitting there at the top of the, uh, you know, at the top of our ranking list in many cases, there's, uh, there's not a lot of internal push for that because the idea that we don't get anything from that, and if we're losing money on every headset, then there's at least this incentive, like you really are free apps good for the ecosystem. So raising the price to a point where we're not like wincing every time we sell a headset that has that really, really positive upside that people can choose to refocus on, you know, we don't care how you use the headset as long as you're getting good value from it. And I think that's really important for us, that this idea that I'm, um, you know, free app lab stuff, free web apps, you know, people sideloading, it's all good. As long as you're getting good value out of this headset, some fraction of the people are going to use you know, the, the best of breed high-end applications that are curated and selling on the Quest store. And that's great. And we'll make money from that. But all this other stuff, I'm happy for it to exist. And I'm happy for there not to be even any uh, just subtle back of the mind, unconscious bias against it. I want us to be celebrating our free applications as much as we possibly can. So, I'm going to go over some of the, the wins that we have gotten in the broader VR ecosystem and check in on some of the things that I talked about last year. So the, the meta accounts getting divorced from Facebook was, I, you know, it's kind of a big deal and you would not believe how much work that took internally. I, I mean, it was really a shocking amount of labor and uh, planning work that had to go into separating all of these things out. Now, it affects much more than just VR. It's all across the whole family of apps. But it was, it was a really, really big deal. And this did remove one of those objections where there was a fair amount of noise online where you had a bunch of never Facebookers that I 
would not get a Facebook account, you know, would not get Quest 2. Now, Quest 2 sold more VR, you know, headsets than all of our other headsets put together. It clearly did not hurt the product that much. And I note that we're not really seeing any huge influx of uh, new people that do not have Facebook accounts right now. But I get the fact that having these different worlds tied together is not a good thing. You know, if you if you have a problem with your Facebook account, it should not affect your VR account. And I am. You know, I I have a little bit more of a personal taste of this. Last month, I actually temporarily got suspended from Twitter because I had posted a VR capture, a mixed reality capture of me playing Beat Saber on a Panic at the Disco song. And some new content trolling thing went over that. It's like, oh, copyright strike. You, uh, you know, you didn't have rights for that. And I'm like, oh, that would have really sucked if this was my VR account and I couldn't get into VR. It was easy to get back in. It was okay, but... I get it. There's a real issue there that we do have to be kind of aware of. Uh, and unfortunately, the benefits that I hope to see from our Facebook integration, we really didn't get that. I mean, we we integrate your friends graph, and that's a good thing. But there was a little point where I still think back to we had a version of venues where we had kind of a deeper Facebook interaction integration where we would look at what you've uh, you know, what posts and things that you've liked, and it would tell you if the person sitting next to you was, uh, you know, had also liked similar things. And I thought that was really cool as kind of an icebreaker way, but uh, it eventually didn't pass kind of our privacy reviews of things. And people don't believe it. They just don't credit it. But there is an enormous amount of oversight and work and review that goes into trying to actually do positive things with all of this data that Meta has. Um, and, you know, I often think it winds up getting in the way of making the features that people are going to feel, you know, are going to have a great time with. But it's important for this company level, um, you know, real doctrine about being very, very careful with all of the user data. So the uh, the headset tracking robustness, you know, as you move around has improved a lot. Internally, we had two completely different tracks of uh, tracking. We had our sort of production tracking, and then we had research tracking. And there was a massive effort to kind of take the best of both of them and merge them all together. And we have real telemetry on this, that a lot of these things like guardian not found and uh, tracking loss situations have been measurably halved over the last year. Now, Individual people still have problems. I mean, I've still got one headset in one room that seems to lose my guardian every single time, and that's frustrating, but we are making some real progress in aggregate. Now, you know, one thing to be aware of that our original specification for what light is necessary for operating quest tracking in, there was some terrifying stat like 30% of the people that are using Quest are using it in light levels that are below what we originally specified. Now, we still work in worse conditions, but that was not what everything was optimized around. So we've got reasons to be kind of retuning what we're doing. But yeah, if you've got an opportunity, flip more lights on when you're doing VR, you can expect the tracking to improve. Uh, the controller extrapolation improved, where this was something that the uh, the developer of 11 Table Tennis, the ping pong game, was he was pushing me hard on this a couple of years ago about how I um, like Vive's extrapolation, the people that were playing on, um, you know, playing ping pong at very high levels, that they could tell the difference of this tens of milliseconds extrapolation going on that our algorithm wasn't as good as what was going on in Vive. So we had some really good people go in, pour over tons of data, big data analysis of things here. And we now have, i um, you know, quite a bit better extrapolation. Now, another interesting thing that came up with that, especially working with some of the newer controllers, so much of this comes from reading the, the IMUs that are inside the headset and the controllers. And it turns out that haptics buzzing in the controller and very loud audio in the headset uh, wi winds up being very disturbing to some of our IMUs. And we're having to take special steps to filter or use different components to kind of make this work out better for us. Uh, AirLink has continued to get improved. Lots of improvements going on in there. Uh, we did announce a dedicated accessory so that you can kind of plug in a special dongle and get sort of optimized for AirLink uh, behavior there. Now, it's important to note that there's not much that it does for you over a perfect setup, where if you're using AirLink, you really do want to have your PC wired, hardwired over Ethernet to your router. Uh, if you don't have that, then 
doing Airlink means a packet goes from your headset to the router to your PC, from your PC to the router to your headset, and that cuts in half and does more damage than that to kind of what you can accomplish over there. Many people still have a great time with that, but if you if you wonder about your quality, having a direct connection works. And this dedicated dongle has a couple other details that are better than what you could normally get out of a uh, out of a commercial router. But the best commercial routers are pretty darn close to this. If you've got a high-end gaming router, it's probably just as good. But um, if you can just grab this and plug it in, it can fix a lot of bad problems for you. Um, App Lab has been uh, has been going great. I uh, I am. In my in my position as customer support of last resort, I do field complaints from people. It's like, oh, I've been in review for five weeks or something. And I follow up with the content team, the people managing the app lab uh, reviews, and I see the, the dashboards and we've really made a lot of progress. It's generally really pretty fast now. We also added in-app purchase for App Lab, which is, I don't know why that wasn't there at the beginning, but it's now got parity. So you can go and you can do lots of good business in App Lab. 120 frames per second support uh, has good uptake. Uh, it was made an official non-experimental feature. I did a demo recently internally that I'm hoping to be able to release publicly when we get some clearance for some uh, some of the media. But it turns out 120 frames per second is also really good for video playback. Uh, it's hard to render 3D worlds unless you're super optimized doing relatively simple things. But if you're playing back video, 60 hertz video now plays wonderfully, where we used to have the, the challenge of 60 frames per second displays are usually too flickery for most people. But if you play back 60 hertz video at 72 or 90, it winds up kind of juddery and not really worth that much. But at 120, it's great. And if you actually play 120 frames per second video at 120 frames per second, that's like smoother than you know any video content you've ever seen in your life. And it looks really good. Now, there's some weird codec issues, but we have like Quest 2 can decode uh, 4K by 4K at 120 frames per second. And that's a really good mono view for a lot of things like sports. That's a great view. Now, one downside is, unfortunately, Quest Pro can't do 120. Uh, it's limited to 90. And this is probably, you know, that was a factor in a lot of the infighting that made 120 frames per second on Quest 2 such a problem to get out and ship. But we came to terms with that. You know, 120 is now just Quest 2 and future headsets. It's good enough that I think nobody gets to say, well, we just don't want to do 120 in the future. The, uh, the hand tracking has continued to improve, but... You know, it's still far from as intuitive as a touchscreen. And there's a problem that everybody's like, well, we just want to have a tablet for the metaverse. Let's just put a tablet right in front of us and we'll just poke at it. Uh, one of the problems with that is the closer something is, the more sensitive it is for latency because a small amount of movement, something way off in the distance there, as I kind of move my head side to side, it's moving fractions of a pixel or a pixel or two. But if I have a tablet right in front of me and I move my head a little bit, that's moving tens of pixels. And if you mispredict that and it's not in the position that you want, that can start leading to some comfort issues. I am seeing the thing judder around there when you're trying to focus on it is a challenge. Now we've got... We've got approaches that can fix this, where we can move panels directly in time warp in the compositor so that they have, instead of 50 milliseconds of latency going through everything, you can get it down to you know 10 milliseconds of latency, which is really great. But then your controllers and hand rendering and anything that goes in front of it need to be rendered on yet another layer, which is composited on top of that. Um, so there's trade-offs, but if we want to do a great job at that, we're probably going to have to do that. If we want to have feedback for all of it instead of just like mushily poking at the air is always problematic there's a lot of work that goes into making 3d buttons that can respond to you and i uh, but most of our surfaces are going to be things like web pages and android apps that are not going to have custom buttons so i keep arguing for just you know put a surface treatment on top of it flag any layer as being touchable and we can do things like have shadows coming underneath it, crosshairs going down, uh, audio cues as you tap things, um, you know, being able to render the hands and have the hands stop in times. There's a whole research lab that's worked on this stuff for us, and it can make hand interactions a lot better than they feel right now. You know, there's still a lot more to be done. And I... Uh, you know, we do have the hands API, which some apps are you know, like Mist are starting to use. It's showing up in some uh, some actual games as well as sort of dedicated hand toy things. Uh, I'm 
I'm curious to see how it's going to work out in fitness apps. And I wonder if there's any optimizations that we should be making for cases where we really don't care about the fingers, but it's just, you know, kind of moving the hands around very rapidly. We can probably do some things to make that work out better. Now, eventually, we're going to want to see this as a primary input method for a headset, but we're not there yet today. It's not easy enough uh, to do the common things, and there's not enough things that you would want to do with that. But it doesn't seem too far off for us to be able to at least get somebody that's using a headset mostly for social work uh, and social interactions to be able to be sort of controller free and just drop the headset on your head, start using your hands. And that will be a good step forward in usability, especially for people that are not common users of this. It's people that give demos to other people and talk, try to educate them about how to use the controllers in VR. It's always a little bit of a stretch. And if it really is just tapping things with your hands, that's going to be a good thing. Uh, productivity has been slowly getting better. Bluetooth keyboard and mouse support's actually getting pretty good. It's like every every year I go and I try to do some research work I completely in VR, just bring out all the web pages and try to use this like I'd be doing uh, with a workstation. And it's still not there yet, but it's getting a lot closer. Uh, last time I checked, Bluetooth keyboard and mouse support just worked. Uh, everything was perfect except the mouse wheel scrolling was a little weird. And I heard that they just like in the last release that got a patch too and, and may be fixed now. The multi-window support's getting better. You know, this is mostly for browser today, but there is this promised land of all Android apps, remote desktop, and all of this coexisting, letting you stretch them out and do all sorts of different things. Um, you know, monitor replacements, not there yet today. But I did have one interesting experience where in the Immersed app, I, you know, when I went into there and my phone's just this giant thing, but I really noticed how much detail I was missing on the phones. And I see that in some of the some of the other cases where I wind up looking at this eight foot wide screen in virtual space. And I don't have great vision. This might not be the case for people with really great vision. But I'm like, oh, I'm seeing more stuff there than I was in reality. This is actually kind of nice having that big setup. So eventually we do want to get to the point where we're having people travel with a headset instead of a laptop, dog fooding that. It's going to be super painful for a while, but it's only that type of work that's going to get us to, to where it really does wind up displacing other devices, which is my whole win condition. You know, we're not going to be able to just get everybody to buy one new device on top of everything else that they have. We have to be something that has all this awesome new stuff, but also displaces one of their other devices. The, uh, the VR camera has improved where we finally have an advanced camera settings dialogue like people have been able to get with console commands or side quest or developer hub, uh, being able to get 16.9 recording, bitrate options, having motion stabilization is really nice. Uh, we do still need an option for kind of toggling on the stereo 3D capture support that I added a while ago. And, uh, and I also want to push for frame rate controls where even in our keynote here, uh, I, I wince a little bit when I see real in-game footage. It's always kind of lurchy because it's captured at some fraction of our display uh, rate, which is not what's being played back in the video. What we need to do for people making high-quality footage for other uses is we need to say it's 60 frames per second capture and force the application to also run at 60 frames per second. You know, it'll be a little flickery at 60, but for your top quality promotional footage, that's really what you want to do. Um, see, casting to the phone flow is also improved. I still do want a zero steps path. I think that what we should have is if your headset, one of your headsets uh, that's paired to your account is in use, you open up your phone, it should just be showing you what's happening there without having to dig into to casting and starting from the device there. The mixed reality capture exists for us now, but it needs to get a lot better. We, we actually had an internal Beat Saber tournament event at Meta, and the kind of special finale was going to be me versus Mark Zuckerberg, and we were going to do mixed reality captures of each of us before they put it all together. And it did not work out. We both got super frustrated. And in the end, we just had, uh, you know, external footage and some poor video production team had to like carefully stitch all of us out for our internal event. And uh, by the way, Mark is really pretty good. Uh, I've spent a lot more time, I think, on Beat Saber, but he's very competitive and he put a hard, hard run at that. I'm. Um, We've got more cool home improvements, uh, not as many as I would like to see if we just opened it up to everybody, but uh, the environments are super high quality. 
Uh, you know, I was just looking at the Lord of the Rings environment that I've got set on this device, and I'm always happy seeing those things there. Uh, that does bring up kind of this point about standards where, you know, people are talking about GL. I, we had, we spent a lot of time adding GLTF support, and I don't think we've gotten literally anything for it because we don't open it up for anybody to kind of make things with it right now. It's just a part of our internal tool chain, and sometimes we don't even use it. If we're going to go to the trouble of using something like this, we need to just let everybody use it, let everybody pull the things in. Even if lots of people make lots of terrible things, there's just some kind of general rule about user-generated content where a lot of it will be terrible. Don't sweat it. There's going to be some amazing, surprising things that happen that you're going to be really happy exist on your platform. Uh, I am, again, running out of time with lots more stuff. Let me at least spend a little bit of time being grumpy on the negative sides here. So the basic usability of Quest really does need to get better. You know, a combination of battery draining if you uh, leave it on and update hell if you turn it off winds up causing a lot of potential VR sessions to get kind of just aborted in frustration. You know, just a couple hours ago, there was an internal post bemoaning the fact that it took 20 minutes in multiple boots for somebody to get an old headset ready for viewing Connect today. And, you know, it pains me to hear people say that they don't even get their headset out to show off to company because they know it's going to be a mess of charging and updating before they can make it do something cool. I mean, VR should be a delight to demo for your friends. Uh, we, have a, we have a physical meta store now uh, that gives demos, and I pushed for making the kind of quality of life for demoing changes in the mainline code, uh, but they, they do use a custom launcher. But uh, my thinking is that if it's too awkward to give a killer demo with the mainline code, we should change the mainline code. Uh, a lot of the usability issues are death of a thousand cuts things, and they can be hard to fight, but it feels like we may be getting a critical mass of people internally really fed up with it. I mean, I make these weekly posts that are a lot internally about me bemoaning all the things that that I think could be better. And I felt, you know, recently it does feel like I'm getting a little bit more traction and there's more people that are kind of sharing my view here. And I, I'm hopeful that this can lead to some more focus on things like that. Like one of the features that's already in uh, kind of in process that I think is going to be super valuable is this idea of an update and power off. Instead of just power off your headset, it'll say, all right, I'm going to power off, but first I'm going to update everything. So you'll never be more than one kind of headset power cycle away from the latest thing. And in fact, I'd like to push almost all of our background processing, you know, all of our telemetry and, che and checking with uh, and the servers and anything that happens there that right now happens at random times throughout your play session should happen at this just when you're turning it off or after you've taken it off your head and it goes to sleep. But we have so many random teams building random servers and they all want to wake up at whatever random point uh, they get a time slice and we need to take more systems level control over this and kind of get a handle on it all. And, you know, you can kind of follow along with my pain and suffering on this because Quest is a, a pretty open system. Anyone can go take a Perfetto trace and, uh, you know, open up ADB Logcat and just look at everything streaming through here. It, you know, it's a horror show where, we have hundreds and hundreds of uh, things that kind of list out as errors in various services just in the time that you wind up booting up the system. And if you, uh, you know, in the old days, I could have ADB Logcat going and I would just get one report a second, VR API frame rate stuff going on. Now, sometimes there's hundreds of reports just spewing off the screen. And if you're not cutting it through some filter or grep, you'll never even get to see anything that you're looking for. I mean, this is, you know, this is a real issue here. Uh, the early headsets, I used to complain when I was working on Samsung phones about all this background processes. And when we had Oculus Go, it was beautifully clean and simple. It's like you could name every process that was going on. You could look at the traces. Everything made sense what it was, what it was doing and what it was there for. Now it's, it's huge. Lots of things are doing stuff when they shouldn't be or doing things that you didn't ask for. And a lot of this can get cleaned up. But there's... I'm, you know, there is this urge to just like flip the table and burn it all down. And someone asked me recently what I thought about the idea of a completely new OS built from the ground up for immersive computing. And I can probably comment on that now where we did have a large internal effort doing just that. And I was not supportive. In fact, you know, one of my internal posts got reported and removed for being not sensitive enough. I I so get the desire to want to do that. I mean, this idea of I'm painfully aware of all the things that are wasteful and 
not good uses of resources. And there's so much that we could do. If you imagine from a clean sheet of paper, first principles view, like how would you write a system that that does a great job at all this? Oh, I, I know what I would want to do with all that. And it would be glorious. But as soon as you wind up opening it up to other teams, other developers, especially third-party developers, you've just given up all of the, the kind of benefits of having super ultra-tight optimized work where we could make some simple applications that are 10 times more efficient than what they would get implemented in at, at, as a progressive web app or something. But uh, most of our apps are doing things like they're running worlds in Unity, or it's running a web page in Chrome. And these are doing real work. And the systems that we have uh, fundamentally, like at the operating system level, it just doesn't matter that much. You know, I like to say 35 million lines of code in Chrome, they laugh at your microkernel optimizations. It's just not going to make that much of a difference. So, you know, you may still want to have your own operating system for strategic reasons. You know, in any, you know, all of these huge tight tech titan companies there's the who's in alliance with who at this time is uh you know are they going to get mad at you and try to do backroom things about whatever and there's fears about that where if you own everything if you write everything yourself you've got total control but it's just not it's just not the wise move if you care about broad third-party developers even if you make something better there's so much value in having Stack Overflow and having all of these other examples of everything that everybody's done. I mean, the Android build environment for native code is horrible. I mean, it's just, I, I get angry and want to throw things when I have to work at it, but I can find answers on Stack Overflow and Google Docs and all the things that other people have done before me. And I wish I could write something that's super clean and easy and has nothing that I don't need, but I know it's really not the right thing to do there. Uh, but now we do have some of these hardcore OS developers working on our Android system. I mean, some of them bailed and I get it. It's like you signed up to build a new pyramid and when you don't get to build a pyramid anymore, you want to go, go try and find something else. But some of these people are now working on systems that I do think can make super strong improvements to our system. Like uh, I keep talking about virtualizing memory and static mapping resources where we have this ability to make jumping into worlds an order of magnitude faster than it is right now. Like if you follow a link into a world in Horizon, the process that everything has to go through, you know, is torturous. And I absolutely stand by that, that it could be literally an order of magnitude faster. And I think that there's the possibility of working with Unity and Unreal at the engine level to build, uh, build things in so every developer doesn't have to learn new things. We just work out some things in the asset provisioning process that can take advantage of some of this uh, new technologies that can work out. So I think that's a practical path to getting some of these cool OS level functionalities in that can really matter, uh, you know, versus boiling the ocean, building a new operating system from scratch, writing new uh, application models, programming languages, all the possible things going on there. So uh, I think we're actually over time. Do I, can I go over time? I've got plenty more I can talk about. Can you give me a cue, Nate? <laughs> well, I guess I'll, <laughs> I'm seeing a no head shake there. All right, well, uh, I'll be heading into a QA and a later on today. Unfortunately, there's only like a dozen something people that are set up for that. Again, my vision for VR Connect is that I could have the same crowds of everybody that wants to listen to me talk for five hours can just cluster around and we'll we'll spend the whole day going over like the like the old days in Physical Connect in California. I think we'll get back to that in VR, maybe even next year, and it's going to be amazing. So, all right.